speak to us this morning on what I call destined to be conformed. Destined to be conformed. In the last few weeks, we've been talking about fulfilling destiny and fulfilling righteousness. And I'll just attempt a quick recap without wasting time on the things that we have spoken about. We started from the story of Jesus, how that Jesus came to the baptism of John, and John said, you are the one that should baptize me. You remember that story. Uh, and uh, Jesus said, suffer it to be so for now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And I said that Jesus was in the path of fulfilling destiny, but what was important to him was not just fulfilling destiny, but fulfilling righteousness. And I did make the point that many times, almost all the time for all of us, we are eager to fulfill destiny, but if God permits us, we like to skip righteousness. We like to skip the process. We just like to, you know, to just emerge, to just manifest. And we did make the point that when it comes to fulfilling destiny, God has his pattern, his process. And it doesn't matter who you are. The fact that God did not bend the process for Jesus already confirms to me that God is not going to bend the process for you. And we said righteousness in this sense is having a right standing with God. Doing what God is doing. Moving when God is moving. Walking when God is walking. And when God is not walking, you are content to be idle. Because you see, there are times when it comes to your case and comes to your matter, God is not walking. There are times when God is not popular in your life. If God is eating, you are eating. You know, there was a time in the life of Jesus that his brethren said to him, these things that you do here, go and show yourself. Go to Jerusalem. Go and manifest. Let it be known that you are powerful. He didn't answer them. But when the time was come, he stepped out and manifested. So we are saying, in the journey of destiny, God has processes. God will take you through his process so that you can become uh, all he wants you to become. And last week, I began to emphasize on the fact that your becoming is more important than your doing. That who you are in God is more important than what you do. That many of the times we only focus on what we want to do or what God wants us to do. But you see, even as much as God is eager to also use you to do the things that he wants you to do, uh, but God is more interested in making you become who he wants you to be. And that is very important. I told you that the moment God encounters Saul on the way to Damascus, his question was, Lord, what would you have me do? And then Jesus said to him, you go to a certain place. It will be told you all that you must do. Uh, you see, the do there is not just fulfilling destiny, but there were processes that God needed to walk uh, Saul through before he became the apostle of many revelations that we now know him to be. Despite that supernatural encounter, he was not immediately that Saul jumped out and began to prophesy and began to become an apostle. No, there were hidden moments of God forming him. We saw in the life of this guy how he lamented and said, the things that I want to do, I could not do them. The ones that I do not want to do, those are the things I find myself doing. And then he cried and said, Lord, who would deliver me from? That was a process. So the mighty apostle went through tutelage, went through teachings under the hands of God. There were things that Paul said, this gospel was not taught me by any man. It was delivered to me by God. So God taught him, took him through the school before he could become an apostle. So there is that processing that God takes us through. To be is more important than to do. Because when you be or become what God wants you to be, to do what God wants you to do is a natural consequence of what you are. If you are in the image of God, you will do the things of God. But if you are out of sync and out of alignment with God, it doesn't matter what you try to do, you cannot do the business of God. It takes a proper son that is in alignment to do the business of the father. 
So I'm going to quickly jump into what I want to talk to us to this morning from Romans chapter 8, verse 29 to 30. Romans chapter 8, verse 29 to 30. I'm going to read the Passion Translation. Uh, I love the King James Version. It's fantastic, but I want us to read the Passion Translation. He said, for he knew all about us before we were born, and he destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of his son. I'd like you to pay attention. This means the son is the oldest among a vast family of brothers and sisters who will become, you see that, who will become just like him. He said, having determined our destiny ahead of time, so you see, our destiny is not something that God is trying to fashion out today. He determined our destiny ahead of time. He called us to himself and transferred his perfect righteousness to everyone he called. And those who possess his perfect righteousness, he co-glorified with his son. So the first thing I need you to see here is that the Bible says he knew all about us before we were born. But more importantly, he destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of his son. The King James Version says, for whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be confirmed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So the part of your destiny that I want us to talk about this morning is the fact that you are destined to be conformed to the image of the Son. You see, when you read the Bible, you must have an holistic overview of what God started and what God is doing. The Bible says in the book of Genesis, uh, God came and called an assembly of himself and said, come, let us make man in our own image and after our likeness. So the very assignment from the beginning was the making of a man who will reflect God in the very essence of God. It will be in the image of God and in the likeness of God. So you see, what he is going to do afterwards is a consequence of who he is. Because you see, a God does not behave like a dog. A goat does not behave like a chicken. A lion will only behave like a lion. So you see, the concept, the issue of identity, the issue of image, the issue of likeness is fundamental to the issue of destiny. As the Lord taught me this, one of the things the Holy Spirit said to me is that the greatest damage that the prophetic, perhaps, has done to the lives of people is that we tell people what God wants them to do and we are not concerned about what God wants them to be. Because you see, for everything that God wants you to do, there is a person you must be for you to be able to do it. And you see, if, if, the, if the image issue is not sorted, the doing issue is already missed. Can I say that again? If the image issue is not sorted, the being issue is already missed. You cannot expect a goat to be flying in the air. Are you getting what I'm talking about? It does, not, it, it does not lie with a goat to fly in the air. Neither does it lie with a, a fish to live on the tree. It does not lie with a bird to live inside the water. It's, a, it's an image issue. If you are who God says you are, you will automatically do what God wants you to do. So God set out in the beginning and said, come, come guys. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our own image after our likeness. It is a consequence of that making in our own image and after our likeness that he now says, then let him have dominion. So you see, dominion is a consequence of image. The people that have dominion, the kind of dominion that God wants them to have, they must first become the kind of person that God wants them to be. Am I making sense this morning? So it's first an image issue. But you see, many times we are concerned about the dominion. 
I want to exercise dominion over money. I want to exercise dominion in the realm of influence. I want to exercise dominion in life and in destiny and in ministry. But you see, no matter how you aspire to that dominion, if you don't become the kind of person that God wants you to be, that dominion is going to be elusive. Come, let us make man in our own image. So when you read through the scriptures, you will see that when God calls people, what he tries to do with them is to first make them. He, he tries to make them. All of what you see, changing people's names, speaking words that seem like motivation to them, he is to transform them from within so that they can see themselves in the right picture of what God says they are. So man's destiny was for him to be in the image of God and then exercise the God kind of dominion. And this does not just mean, uh, you know, to look physically like God, but to operate like God. There is an operating system of God that if it is in you, you will be able to operate like God. How you are made determines how you operate. If you are made to fly, you are an aeroplane, you cannot operate as a ship. And the ship is made hollow so that it can stay on water. It cannot fly, no matter what happens to it. How you are made determines how you operate. If Adam had stayed the way God made him and chosen the path of life, he would have exercised dominion without stress. You see, the moment he chose the other way, then the path of the, the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the Bible says he was chased out of the Garden of Eden, his operation changed. The place where he was changed, the way he was living his life also changed. So not only that he moved out of Eden, he moved out of status. Even though he still was a man, but he was no longer a man of God. He was no longer a man of God. So he was created to be in the image of God so that he could live the life of God. Created to be in the image of God so that he could live the life of God. If the issue of being confirmed to the image of the son is sorted, you will, we will all operate in the capacity of God. You see, what was spectacular about Jesus was the fact that Jesus, even though he was born as a man, was operating as God on earth. Why? He was in perfect alignment. He was the image of the Father. You know, as I study the Bible, sometimes I tend to think to myself that all of the great actors that God brought us their stories in the scriptures, what he was trying to see was to measure the depth, the length, the breadth, the, the scope of the alignment with the class of image that he had in mind when he created Adam. So from the moment Adam fell, God began to pick people, men from different generations, and began to try to work with them to see how much man in that state can try to attain to the measure of the stature of the fullness that God wanted the original man to operate in. Are you getting what I'm talking about? So he will choose a man like David and said, this guy is a man after my own heart. Yeah, but as good as he was, we saw his flaws. But you see, when Jesus appeared, the Bible says when he came to the baptism of John, a voice came out of the heaven saying, this one. You see, we've been trying several one, but this one is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. He's not the first one that God will be pleased with, but he, he was well pleased in him. God has been pleased with different people. What shall we say our father Abraham found? He pleased the Lord. The book of Hebrews told us how many people pleased the Lord because of their exercise of faith. But when it came to Jesus, the Bible says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. When it comes to alignment, he was in perfect alignment with God. Perfect alignment. Jesus was in sync with God. He came in the image of the Father. And he was operating in the image of the Father. So you hear him say stuff like, it is as the Father walk that I walk. So it means if God is not doing something, Jesus is not interested in doing it. And not because he lacks the capacity to do it, right? But he must follow the original pattern. Have you read your Bible and see what the Bible calls the mystery of godliness? 
said this is the mystery of godliness is that God is manifested in the flesh. So you see, what God was trying to do in Adam was called the mystery of godliness. Adam was supposed to be a God operating on the earth. He was the image of God. If he had subscribed and stayed with the path of life, he would have been operating at that full capacity. How do you sleep and then they take a part of your rib and make a woman. And then you wake up and say, this is the bone of my bones. He was not alive when that was made. There was a part of the omniscient value of God that was residing in Adam. He had the word of knowledge, if you want to call it that way. The fullness of the spirit, the manifestation of the gift of the spirit did not start in the New Testament. It started with Adam. I sleep through the process of creation, but woke up and accurately defined this one. This is not a monkey. This is the bone of my bone and the flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman. And then the Bible says all the animals were brought to him to see what he will call them. So they were already named. They just wanted to find out if the cognitive ability of Adam in the spirit was accurate. And the Bible says all that he called them, that was their name. So they had a name before he called them. He had access to the mind of God because he was made in the image of God. But the protocol of sustenance in that mold and fashion in which he was created was that he would be able to eat of every tree in the garden, including the tree of life. But the tree of the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he must not subscribe to. He must not subscribe to. Unfortunately, he rebelled and subscribe to it. Now, when you look at the temptation of Jesus, you will see that the image issue is a critical issue. The son of God and the son of man, dual identity, as you will call it, the devil came to him and said, if you are the son of God, turn this stone to bread. And Jesus replied saying, man shall not live by bread alone. Yet, in another breath in that same temptation, when the devil said, uh, bow down, worship me, and you see all the glory of the world I will give to you. Jesus said to him, it is written that you will not tempt the Lord your God. So he is both son of man, yet he is God. You see, the way God created man to operate, the accurate man is that he will be man on earth, but he will have the stature of God. He will be able to operate as God over, that's the concept of dominion. Over life, over the devil. You see, the devil didn't have power over Adam in the garden. He was around, but he didn't have power. So when people say, oh, you are a child of God, there are things you don't have power over, I don't agree with you. If you are a proper son and you are in alignment with God, the, the pedestal of your dominion is above any other thing on earth. You are only made lower than the Elohim. Only lower than the Elohim. So the only place the devil could come in was to deceive him and make him fall from his height. So that when he falls from his height, then the devil can begin to mess him up. So this issue is important. Being in alignment with God. Walking in alignment with God. I want us to see this morning what God does in trying to bring us to that place where we are conformed to the image of the Son. Because essentially, all of what God is trying to do is to restore us. The concept of redemption is to the end that you will be able to come back to full capacity and operate where God wants you to operate. There will have been no redemption if there was no fall after creation. If Adam did not fall, there will be no, nothing called salvation. He was born a child of God. The reason why God had to do redemption plan was because this original project that God was doing, uh, this guy, you know, the project was ruptured because of the rebellion of man having a will to exercise in the making. Now, what God is doing in Christ is that he's trying to bring us in the second Adam to the fullness of that capacity that we found in Jesus. So your destiny is not just that. You see, when we talk about destiny, we only think about it in assignment. Oh, my destiny is to do this for God. Yeah, that is a part of your destiny. 
But you see, the greatest part of your destiny is that you be conformed to the image of the Son. And you see, the, all other things that you think are important, I will do this, I will do that, they are secondary. If you conform to the image of the Son, you will naturally do the things that God has called you to do. You will be able to do the business of the Father because of your accurate alignment with God. So this is important. And we cannot take the wrong route to arrive at the right destination. You know what the devil did to Adam in the Garden of Eden? That the, the tree of life was in the garden, but the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was also there. If Adam had stayed with God, eating every other fruit in the garden and the tree of life, he would have been fine. But you know what the devil wants us to do? The devil always wants man to take the wrong direction and expect or believe that he will arrive at the right destination. We love what is good and perfectly provided for us in God, but more often than not, man likes to take the wrong way to get to destiny. The way of the tree of life is different from the way of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When good is mixed with evil, he doesn't produce God. When good is mixed with evil, he doesn't produce God. So what the devil wants to achieve is a situation where you are messed up, you are mixed up, you are diluted, you are confused, you are no longer original, you are deformed. You know what it means to be a devil? A devil is a deformed being. He was created an angel, but by virtue of mixing good with evil, he became a devil. So what he wants to also achieve in humans is a place where even though you are man, you are no longer man of God. You now come to a point in your life where you can traffic either God or the devil. And God does not want you to do that. What God intended in the beginning was that man will only traffic God. The only thing you will give expression to is the will of God, the mind of God, the business of God. So, after Adam fell, God had to do something in Christ. What God is doing in Christ is that he's bringing us back to stature. He's bringing us back to become the presence that can fulfill the God kind of destiny. The God kind of destiny. So, when he brought Jesus to the scene, he was so that he might become the pattern for other sons. King James Version calls him the firstborn among many brethren. That's what God did with him. By the time he appeared at the testing ground and his sonship was put to test, he, he manifested true sonship. A son that will not do what the father is not doing, even though he has the power to do what the father was not doing. Turning the stone to bread was not Jesus' problem. He could have done that cheaply by just speaking to the stone. Stone, become bread. But that was not what God was doing. He said, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. His goal was not just to do, but to do what the Father was doing. His desire was not to show up, but to glorify the Father. They are two different things. So you see, in this world, we can do many great things, but there can be great things that are not God things. A person can do great things, achieve things that men applaud, yet everyone is looking at him and saying, what is he building? You remember that in the book of Genesis 11, a, a generation of men came together and said, let us build a tower whose height will reach to the heavens. And then the Bible says, God came to in uh, inspect it and said, this is not what I am doing. And he scattered their language. So the fact that a project is gargantuan, is big, is, 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 is influential, is raving, does not mean that it is what God is doing. So that when the Bible now says, be not conformed to this world, because you see, this world is led by three things. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And if those three things are the things on which you are prayed, you will do what God is not doing. That's the truth. You will do what God is not doing. Because the flesh, the Bible says the flesh lost and fights against the spirit. 
So the things that the flesh wants to do, which are ministrations of the devil, are things that negate what God is doing. So if all you subscribe to is this world, you will do what God is not doing and you will think you are doing something great. Now, let's look at the life of Jesus. If he says, be not conformed to this world, that's Romans chapter 12 verse 2. He said, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So you see, the transformation is to the end that you can know what is the will of God. Because you can do many things that are not the will of God. Praise God. A man on earth can do many things that are not the will of God. And he can get the applause of men. He can be celebrated in the company of men. Yet God is looking at it and saying, this one is not doing our business. He's doing his business. You will hear the testimony of Jesus. I must be about my father's business. So a man can be in business and he's doing his own business. And he's doing the devil's business. But the sons of God are called to do the business of the father. And you know many of the times, the things that, the paths that God will take us through in the journey of our doing his business, they may not be popular paths. They may not be popular paths, but it is wisdom to choose the path of God. It is wisdom to walk in the ways of God. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 7. Let's learn a bit from Jesus. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 7. I'm going to read the Passion Translation. He said, and consider the example that Jesus the anointed one has set before us. Consider the example that Jesus, the anointed one, has set before us. He said, let his mindset become your motivation. He existed in the form of God, yet he gave no thought to seizing equality with God as his supreme prize. Instead, he emptied himself of his outward glory by reducing himself to the form of a lowly servant, he became human. You see, what he's saying here is that if you are going to operate in conformity with the image of the son, you must understand the mindset of sons. That in this case, Jesus could operate in the capacity of God. He could declare rebellion. He could establish his own government. You see, the will that God has given to us is something that separates us from every other creature in the creation of God. Man is that being that has that ability to choose to do good or evil. He has the prerogative of choice. That used to be the exclusive preserve of God. But man has it. He can choose to serve God. God could just have done it such that we are robots. You don't get. We are robots. So you have no choice in the matter. You just serve the law. You just, you just have no choice in the matter. Whether you are happy or you are not happy, you serve the law. But you know what God gave you? Is, is the will is the ability of God. Is the ability to do and not to do. God can do and undo. God can choose to do and choose not to do. That was one thing that is shared with man. Such that you can choose between the path of life and the path of death. God is not going to force a man to serve him. No. If he forces you to serve him and takes away the prerogative of your choice, then that is no longer service. It's servitude. There are two different things. A slave has no choice in the matter, but a son has a choice. A son can choose to do the business of the father or can choose to walk away from the father. There were two sons in the story of the prodigal son. One took his heritage and walked away. The other one stayed at home. He's a prerogative of sons. So when he says that Jesus here, he said we have to consider his life, the example of Jesus. You know, Jesus could have stepped out on earth and decided to establish a, a new government. And stop, because you see, the path that the Godhead set out for him was not a popular path. There was a time in the life of Jesus that the people wanted to make him a king. Meanwhile, the pathway that heaven chose for him was that he would become a king through the cross. 
Not through popular opinion. It was not public. No, 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 no. The Bible says they wanted to make him a king. He was doing well. He could have established a government. In fact, he disappointed his disciples because the disciples were asking him, when will you restore the kingdom to Israel? They were thinking that there is a popular way to do this thing. You could have toppled the government and become anything you want to become. But Jesus stood with the ways of God. That's the part of songs. He did not set up his own government. You see, the life of man on earth is not one of independence. It is one of dependence. So we are not here to be independent. We are not here to do what we want to do. We are here to do the business of the Father. So you see, Jesus chose the way of the cross because that was the way the Father chose for him. He chose. He was not a popular part. And that's why one of my mentors says, see, if you want to be popular in this world, he said, go and sell ice cream. Now, even when you sell ice cream, there are people that will not like your ice cream. We are not called to, you know, do what is popular and, you know, no, no, no. We are called to do the business of the Father, even when it doesn't make sense. There are things that God will ask you to do and you'll be wondering, why is he asking me to do this? Why has he chosen this path? You know, Jesus came to the Garden of Gethsemane and said, Lord, uh, let's talk about this thing. This part that we, we, we spoke about before I came. If it is possible for you to make this cup to pass over me, as, as things happen to you as a believer, and you are wondering, God, why is this thing happening to me? And yet it's like God is silent. It is the part of songs. The Bible says Jesus learned by the things that he suffered. The Bible says that even our earthly fathers, they chastise us for their own liking. But there is a chastising, a discipline that God brings through the part of song. You may not like it, but it is the part of songs. It is the process of songs. There are better ways to do what God wants you to do. And there are many of such better ways that the devil will give you the opportunity. But you must understand that if it is not the way of God, it is not the way of life. Don't choose the path of the knowledge of good and evil. Choose the path of life. Choose the path of life. Choose the path of life. If you turn stone to bread, you are eating poison. Because God will not make bread from stones. God is not going to make bread from stones. The devil said, jump down from this place and let's prove that you are the son of God. If you jump down from a place that God has not asked you to jump, your angels are going to be looking like, like this. You will break your leg and they will wonder, what, what were you thinking about? If you worship the devil to get the glory, you will end up in serious shame. The part of the glory has been ordained by God. And like Jesus, we must submit to that protocol, submit to that path. So that we can walk in the path that God has called us to walk in. He has predestined us to be conformed to the image of the Son. We are predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. So we must consider Jesus who had the opportunity to set up a fresh government. The Bible says he gave no thought to seizing equality with God. He gave no thought to it. Instead, he emptied himself of his outward glory. He submitted his will. What he means here by emptying himself of his outward glory was the fact that he did not exercise his will against the will of the Father. And that's the life of the son. That's the life of the believer. You choose the part that God says this is the way. You know the man who song, I choose the way of the Lord. That's the part of songs. And you know the Bible says there is a way that seemeth right to man, but the end thereof are the ways of destruction. The devil always wants us to choose that path, the path of turning stone to bread, the path of jumping up to manifest, the path of bowing down to the devil to accept the glory of the world. Meanwhile, there is a greater glory that God has prepared for sons, but the path, the process to it, the journey to conforming to the image of the son will not be easy, but that is the path that leads to true glory. That is the path that leads to true glory. The price of alignment may be tough, but it is the route to eternal significance. 
It is a wrap to eternal. If God had other ways, he would have taken us through. So while you are concerned with, I want to do God's word to us is pay attention to, I want to be like Jesus. I want to operate like Jesus. To be in alignment with the Father. Always in alignment with the Father. The price of that alignment may be tall. There may be seasons in your life that you do not appreciate what God is doing. Yet you will see that God is always encouraging you. Praise God. It's tough, but yet God will be sending you encouraging word to guide you through. Because that is the pathway for you to be conformed to the image of the Son. The sad thing is that if a person chooses to be conformed to this world, he cannot fulfill the purpose of God. You cannot enter into life by eating from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's not possible. You cannot choose the wrong way and arrive at the right destination. You know we live in a generation that says it is the end that justifies the means. No, sir, not with God. Not with God. The end does not justify the means with God. It is the means that justifies the end. It is the means. You escape from the cross. And yet you want to ascend in glory. It's not God. It is the cross. The shame of the cross is what bats the glory of the throne. If you escape from the cross, you cannot be seated on the throne. It's not possible. That's the way of God and nothing is going to change it. The ways of God are not calculated to please you. They are calculated to make you. It's not, God is not so much as interested in your pleasure. He is much more interested in his purpose. It is first the purpose of God before the pleasure of the persons involved. So you will see Jesus saying, it is into your hands that I commit my soul. You got to submit. You got to yield to the father of all spirits. And you see, if, if God cannot walk with you, in the path that he has chosen for you, his principle is that my spirit will not always strive with man, for he also is flesh. But if a man walks in the path of the spirit and submits himself to the ways of God, he's going to find out that at the end of the process, there is a great glory. The things that God is taking us through cannot be compared to the far weight of glory that is ahead for us. But there is a destiny upon us to fulfill, to be conformed to the image of the Son. You know, when Jesus was walking in alignment with the Father, there was nothing the Father could do in heaven that he couldn't do on earth. He said, for you to know that the Son of Man had power on earth, both to forgive sins. He said to the man, your sins are forgiven. The people are like, what are you talking about? Oh, he said, I will show you another dimension. Which one is easy? To forgive sin or to say, rise up, take up your bed and walk. But for you to know that I am the Son, I am in alignment, I will do the two. Your sins are forgiven, then take up your bed and go. He was operating in full capacity. He wasn't struggling. So when we submit to the process of God like that, you come to become a person who naturally fulfills the purpose of God. You see, we will naturally fulfill the purposes of God when we become the version of God that he wants us to be. If you are the person that God wants you to be, you will naturally do the things of God. You will naturally do... You see, Jesus said something in the Bible. He said, you are of your father, the devil. And his works, you shall do. And he was talking to religious people. They had become hypocrites. And listen, hypocrisy in the eyes of God is not just, you know, that you are showing yourself to be something that you are not. These guys descended from the class of elders that God took of the spirit of Moses and put upon them. They were people of alignment who were in the spirit. But over time, they became traditional people. They left the ways of God and began to fashion a new way for themselves. So Jesus looked at them, religious leaders, I men in the religious circle, and said, you are of your father. The word of there means you originated from the devil and his work you will do. So the point I want to make this morning is the person from whom you originate determines what you do. You cannot be of the devil and be doing the business of the father. You know, when I was much younger and the Lord began to teach me about purpose, 
uh, if you, I was teaching these 10, 12 years ago, my emphasis will have been on the gift of, of God upon your life. The gift and the calling of God that without repentance. I will have been emphasizing on your passion. Uh, what makes you happy and what makes you sad. If you feel pain, that is what God... I found out that you can be gifted and use the gift to worship the devil. You can be passionate and be passionately wrong. The fact that you are passionate does not mean you know the mind of the Father. It is sons that are in alignment who understand what the Father is doing. It means that in the spirit, you'll be able to look up and say, this is what God is doing. Your spirit will pick it up and then you'll be able to do it. We cannot do the business of the Father in the flesh. Somebody says, I'm fulfilling my purpose. I'm just using my gift. I say, no. Gifts can be abused. I'm just, have you had people say, follow your mind? If you follow your mind, you will land in a place that God does not know. We follow the spirit. As many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Have you had people say, follow your passion? Excuse me? If you follow your passion, it was passion that Samson followed. He landed in a place where his eyes was blind. You can't follow your passion. You have to follow the spirit. You have to follow the father. Jesus was passionate about the father's business. At age 12, he will have hit the ground running. But he went back in alignment and submitted to the process of the father. 18 years later, he emerged and did business for three and a half years. The world is still gaining from it. All those, um, you know, they are popular, but they are not correct. Follow your mind. Follow your gift. Follow your passion. They have their places. But ultimately, you must follow the spirit. You must be in alignment with the father. Must be in alignment with the Father. Let me quickly wrap up as I talk about John. As we speak about the price of alignment, it may be tough, but it is a divine route to significance and eternal elevation. It was John in John chapter 3, verse 30, that said, I must decrease that he might increase. That mighty prophet that rose and caught the attention of a whole region. All men came to him. He was given the exclusive opportunity to be the one that will introduce Jesus to us. He was the one that introduced Jesus. His destiny was to be the forerunner. Run before. And the moment the actual runner comes, you take away. You see, when you are running a relay race, the people who run before the last guy comes, they are forerunners. And the forerunner does not run forever. You run up to the point where you hand over the baton to the last leg. The moment you hand over, you leave the track. So you see, as he concerned the life of John, as anointed as he was, as popular as he was in the region, the plan of God for John was that John will hand over the baton. From the day he pointed to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That was the end of his ministry. So it means a ministry can end. He had fulfilled. I was listening to a great guy from uh, one African country that was doing an interview with uh, James Aladino. And he was saying the young girl that discipled them in the university, you know, had to go home to the father that her business was done. You could be so anointed to the point that you continue to do what God is no longer doing. You're doing a program. The program becomes so popular. The only thing that now drives it is the fact that people come and you feel good. But God is no longer doing the program. And one of the ways you find out is that you begin to weary yourself. Because the moment the grace of God to do a thing leaks, it is no longer the spirit that is doing it. It is now your flesh. And your flesh cannot do the business of God. You'll be tired. And I've seen people try to sustain what God is no longer doing. He ends in a disaster. We must be humble enough to acknowledge that, you see, God was doing it up till now, but now he's no longer doing it. And if he's no longer doing it, we don't have a business doing it. We go back and align. If he says there is another program, then we stand up and say, now this is the new thing the Lord is doing. To be in a place where God used to be is a very dangerous thing. So he handed over the baton. This is the Lamb of God. His destiny was to point him out. And he was sensitive at this point when he was making this. He said, I must decrease. He, two of his disciples left him and went to Jesus. 
He did not complain. At a point in the ministry of John, people came to him and said, that guy, you know that guy, your, your cousin, the one that you introduced at Jordan, everybody has followed him. He said, that's okay. I must decrease. That. So when this popular guy became unpopular to the extent that he died as if he was not a prophet, his head was taken away. Do you know what Jesus now said after he had died? He said, of all that is born of a woman, this one is the greatest. I'm like, what? How can he be the greatest? And he died so cheaply. He is the greatest because he came and did what God chose him to do. He disappeared from the scene as soon he began to decrease. You see, it was not God that decreased him. It was John that said, I must. It's a deliberate thing. John could have opened fresh banners after he showed Jesus. And be contesting with Jesus for the, for the soul of the people. Jesus will have established his own baptism. John will have established his own baptism. The doctrines and baptism of John were so popular that even in the days of Paul, there were men who still just knew only the baptism of John. He had to decrease. If he had continued, if the thing that he was ordained to be, he would have become an obstruction to that same thing. So Jesus' doctrine will have been competing with John's doctrine. Because John had the followership. John had people. He had disciples. He handed over his disciples to Jesus. He allowed the crowd to migrate to Jesus. He said, I must decrease that he might increase. There is no way to fulfill our destinies in God if we don't learn this pathway. The pathway of sons aligning with God. He became the greatest of all men outside of the kingdom. So our obsession must be to always say to the Lord, Lord, I don't just want to do anything. I want to do what you're doing. I don't just want to do. I want to do what you're doing. I want to be like your son, Jesus. His path was tough, but he became, you know, the Bible says he's been given the name that is above every other name. Why? Because he yielded to the Father. He submitted to the Father. He aligned with the ways of the Father. It was tough, but he led him to eternal glory. And if there is anything you can be rest assured of, it is the fact that if you yield to the Father, your ending is going to be glorious. In our alignment is our assignment. That's very important. It is in our alignment that our assignment is situated. The more we are aligned with God, the more we will find out what God is doing. You know, there are many people who are praying and say, Lord, show me my assignment. If you are in, um, you are like 180 degrees off route, no matter how you pray, you cannot get to that destination until you find your way back to the right route. That's when you can get to that destination. So it will not just be, Lord, show me what you have called me to do. It will be, first, Lord, help me to be the person you have called me to be. Help me to be aligned, to be conformed to the image of the Son. The degree to which we are aligned in conformity to the image of the Son, we will now see what the Father is doing in the Son. You know what? Everything that God is doing, God is doing in Jesus. So a man outside of Jesus cannot be fulfilling the plans of God as it were. He can't be fulfilling the plans of God as it were. But when we conform to the image of the Son, the part that God, because we are, you see, the reason why we are called the body of Christ is because Christ is the head. And it is the head that coordinates everything that God is doing. So every part of the body must first conform. So imagine a man standing as a rapper. He has a body. Assuming that the hand has a will of his own. The leg has a will of his own. They just decided that they are going to detach from his head. Just like the value of dry bones in Ezekiel 37. The bones were scattered. That body cannot do the will of anybody. Now when the breath of life came into them, they conformed. They came back. The Bible says bones joined to bones. 
every part of the body, of that body, in the valley of many dry bones, every bone found its original head. And when they aligned and became, the Bible says they became an exceeding great army. That army that God could lead to victory. The only way the body of Christ will come to a place where we can begin to fulfill the purposes of God on earth is that every part of the body finds alignment to the head and then we begin to fulfill the purposes of God. I'd like us to bow down our heads as we pray this morning and say, Lord, help me to conform to the image of the Son. I, I don't want to be disjointed. I don't want to be on my own. You know how they say you are on your own. Can somebody talk to the Lord this morning and say, Lord, I don't want to be on my own. I don't want to do what you used to do. I don't want to do what you are no longer doing. What I want to do is what you are doing. Help me to be conformed.